Good morning. Good morning. Last time I was up here to do some meeting meditation, I was, I had a whole crowd of Sam and a camera and an empty hall. This is so much better. I don't have to imagine the Smith clan here and, uh, and Chris and Sherry. I can actually see you all. This is so much, so, so much better. Uh, We've been going through some pretty wicked times lately. Um, you know, God told or talked to uh, or sent a letter through John to the, the church in Smyrna that in Revelation that said, you know, I'm going to test you for a while. And if you stay, uh, if you stay stolid with me, if you continue to follow my ways, you're going to be rewarded with the crown in heaven. Well, we've been going through some pretty trying times these last four months, and it's not even close to being over yet. Uh, it was bad enough just dealing with, with this plague that's going around, uh, not being able to, to be together, to share communion, to, to just fellowship. Well, we're kind of over most of that, but... This virus wants to come back at us. Now, I don't know if it's going to hurt us too bad or not, but that's something still that we got another trial to, to deal with. And right now, too, we've got all of this rioting and protesting, and I just look at that as another trial that God's putting us through where we've got to just continue to, to be faithful, to, uh, to be strong, and to and trust him. We can do that. We're gonna we're gonna have that victory, and no matter how long it takes us, we're gonna we're gonna make it to to be in uh, in heaven with our Lord. Uh, on <coughs> excuse me, we read in First uh, Corinthians how that last trial and tribulation time that Jesus went through, the Last Supper, right before uh, he was betrayed and and, uh, and judged and whipped and beat and, and put on that cross. He had the, the 12 together. And uh, during that meal, that last Passover meal, Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For, whoever, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Father God, we uh, thank you so much for giving us your son to give us something to really believe and trust in uh, that even though we go through these trials and tribulations and and these uh, scary times we know that you are there you're watching over us you're caring for us you're protecting us from the evil one fathers we take this this bread and cup we want to remember that that you didn't have to give your son we, we were born into the sins, we accepted the sins, but you gave us your son to take those sins away from us. As long as we have trust and belief in him and you, we've, we've, got, this, we've got this all beat. I ask that you continue to be with us as we go through the service and, and watch over us as we go through the week. It's through your son, Jesus Christ, that I pray. Amen.
Good morning. So glad that you could make it, and it's always nice to see a few faces that haven't been able to be here yet since we've been open here, and uh, we're just so happy to see you. Uh, For those of you that are still listening at home, that's okay. We understand that too, and until you feel comfortable and ready, uh, we want you to continue to watch these videos at home and enjoy them in that setting. Uh, Today, uh, we're starting a little mini-series. Um, And two weeks from today, Kelsey and I won't be here. We'll be on vacation. And so I decided to do a two-week mini-series on Jeremiah and Lamentations. And unbeknownst to me, I didn't realize how hard that would be. (laughs) And so I don't have a PowerPoint today because uh, this is probably, in some ways, one of the harder sermons I've written since being here. Not because there's not a lot of good material in Jeremiah. It's that there's too much. And so in trying to sum up Jeremiah and Lamentations in two weeks, I was really struggling with exactly how to go about that. And so uh, I actually finished up my sermon yesterday afternoon and uh, didn't get a chance to make a graphic or anything for the PowerPoint. And so uh, I apologize about that, but hopefully you'll be able to follow along with me even without the PowerPoint this morning. So for some of you, you may already know this, but others of you might not. Um, I kind of hit, uh, finished up college and uh, went into ministry a little bit later than most. I was in my early 30s before I really finished college, and I'm only 36 now, so that means I've really only been doing full-time ministry for about the last five, six years. And uh, I took the uh, 12-year path to get a four-year degree, and now, in my defense, I did have a six-year break in between the beginning and the end at one point. Uh, But during that six years, I did a lot of things, but one of the things I did was I actually managed a Papa Murphy's Pizza. And so uh, Papa Murphy's only really has one manager because it's a smaller pizza chain. And so I was the manager for the store. This meant that I was in charge of marketing. I was in charge of uh, all the sales of the food. I was in charge of hiring and firing and everything. And what I found, and even though this might seem kind of callous or not great, but what I found, it is easier to fire someone than hire someone. It is easier to fire someone than hire someone. And that might seem weird. But when you're hiring someone, there's always a little bit of doubt in your mind. A little bit of doubt if that person's going to work out or were they just really good at first impressions. A little bit of doubt if they actually, uh, on their application they filled out, were they 100% truthful. And you can ask some questions, try to figure out some of that stuff. But since it was an entry-level job, it's not like they had references necessarily on there. A lot of my uh, employees were high school students or early college students. and Many of them had never worked before. And so who was I supposed to call for a reference to see how their job uh, would be, how they would be on the job? And so it's always a little bit of a uh, wonder, a little iffy situation on whether or not this person was truly going to work out. But the manager before me that kind of trained me before she stepped down and myself had been very uh, good about getting together a packet of stuff, exactly what was required of the job and what was a fireable offense. And so that meant when it came time that I had to fire someone, it was real easy. It wasn't a problem at all because we laid down the groundwork very clear and they signed a piece of paper showing that they understood everything that was on there. And so it meant that whenever it came time to it and someone had to be let go, it really, I didn't lose much sleep over it because we told them exactly what they should and should not do. It was very clear. Now, don't get me wrong, I hated that they were losing a job, but at the same time, we needed people that we could depend on to do the work that they were supposed to do. And so we had this, uh, this clear expectations laid out for them. And so it gave me great peace of mind when I did have to let someone go. You know, I remember one of the things that we actually said in our packet was that uh, if you don't show up for work, we take that as your notice that you quit. We are not firing you. <laughs> And so that made it real easy. I didn't have to worry if they came back and said, well, can I pick up my next shift? I'm like, no, you quit. <laughs> it's real clear. We, we put that out from the go. You don't show up for work, you quit. That's the way it worked. And it was clear. That's the way it was. And for many of us, whether it's a job or something else, we've entered into some sort of an agreement before where it was very clear what the expectations were. So whether this was, uh, like I said, a job or maybe it was a marriage, some sort of agreement that you had with someone, that you were clear exactly what this meant. You know, your vows in a marriage set 
forth the parameters of what that marriage is supposed to entail. It sets forth, this is what this marriage is supposed to be like. For better or for worse, till death do us part. It's clear. This is what a marriage is supposed to be. This is what the parameters are. And so whenever we have these agreements, whether you call them a contract or an agreement or a vow or even a covenant, we have these agreements that are clear what's expected. Well, today in our passage, we're getting to this covenant that God had with the nation of Israel. Now, at this time, when Jeremiah is about, the nation of Israel has split. And so I might slip up and say Israel from time to time. But no, if I say Israel, I mean Judah, okay? Uh, Because Judah is the southern kingdom, and that's who Jeremiah dealt with. He dealt with the southern kingdom of Judah. But it's just so ingrained in us when we're talking about Old Testament and the covenant, we tend to talk about Israel. And so just know that in advance, that if I accidentally say Israel, I mean Judah, Um, But Judah was part of the nation of Israel until it split after the reign of Solomon. And whenever there was that infighting and they couldn't decide, and there was a north and there was a south, and there was Israel who uh, pretty much only ever did bad things, and there was a south who pretty much mostly did bad things, but occasionally, very occasionally, did some good. And that's who Jeremiah is prophesying to. And so I want to talk a little bit about this covenant relationship between Judah and and God. You see, this relationship was clear what the parameters were. They were to follow God with all their hearts, all their strength, all their mind, and follow after him and him alone. We see the Ten Commandments. You know, many of us grew up with the Ten Commandments, whether it's Sunday school or even just uh, for many years, you know, at the courthouses and different things, there'd be the Ten Commandments posted. And so we were used to the Ten Commandments. That's the parameters This is what's expected of you. These are the things that God is requiring. And if you do that, then God will protect you. He will bless you. He will give you the things you need if you follow the agreed upon parameters. Now we know the way the story ends. We know that Israel and Judah did not follow. In fact, from pretty much day one, they didn't follow. In fact, when Moses was on the mountainside getting this agreement, the the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments on the tablets, from that moment, they didn't follow. Because while he was doing that, while he was uh, getting these things from God, what is Aaron and the rest of the Israelites doing? Building a golden calf to worship. Now, what's that first, second, third commandment again? And so we have this breaking of the covenant from the get-go. And yet, God continues to hold up his end of the bargain, but he sends these prophets to remind the people of Israel that they're not meeting theirs. They're not meeting their end of the bargain. And so he's given them second chance after second chance after second chance to the point that there's almost no chances left to give. Yet because God is a God of grace, even in the Old Testament, he continues to give them a second chance. Never seems to stop. Yet Israel continues to spit in the face of God and ignore all these chances. And eventually God has had enough. He's had enough of Israel not holding up their end of the covenant, not doing what they're supposed to do. And so we have Jeremiah here. And at this time, Israel's already come and gone. It's already been conquered by the Assyrians. And they've seen what happens when people don't follow God, yet they're still not following God. And so God sends Jeremiah to come and prophesy and explain to them what's happening and what's going to happen. And so if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to Jeremiah chapter 7. And then quickly after Jeremiah 7, we're going to flip over to Jeremiah 25. So it'll just be a couple pages past. So just to give you the heads up on that. So Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 5 through 7. And here we see God talking through Jeremiah to the people. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice one with another, 
If you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave you of old to your fathers forever. We talked about second chances. This is God giving the Israelites their probably 1,000th chance at this point. And yet he's doing it again. He's telling them, if you do these things, which the reason why he's pinpointing these things is because they weren't doing them. And so he's saying, if you do these things, these things that you're, you're not doing, that you should be doing, then I will still take care of you. I will give you this land of your fathers forever. Then we turn over to chapter 25. In chapter 25, we see that uh, the tone is a little different here. So he's not still asking them to change, but instead he's got a little different tone. So in chapter 25, verse 4, going through verse 7, it says, You have neither listened nor inclined your ears to hear, although the Lord persistently sent you all of his servants, the prophets, saying, Turn now, every one of you, from your evil way and evil deeds, and dwell upon the land that the Lord has given to you, and your fathers of old and forever. Do not go after other gods to serve and worship them or provoke me to anger with the works of your hands. Then I will do you no harm. Yet you have not listened to me, declares the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the work of your hands and to your own harm. And if we were to read a little farther, we see that God is telling them directly in the verses after this, that Babylon is going to come conquer them. Not that they might, or that they will if they continue to do it, but he gave them a warning in chapter 7. Now in chapter 25, he's saying, okay, the warning's over. You didn't do what I told you to do. Now you're paying the consequences. And so we come to this passage, and Israel had very clear sins that God was pointing out, and the ones that he pointed out in chapter 7, and what really all of Jeremiah is about is the fact that Israel isn't doing two things that they really should be doing. And the first thing that they're doing that they should not be doing is they're oppressing the less fortunate. They're oppressing the less fortunate. It doesn't matter if it was foreigners coming into their land. It doesn't matter if it was orphans or widows, those were the ones that were specifically mentioned, those three. But whatever it may be, they were oppressing them rather than loving them and taking care of them and showing them God's love and mercy. And they were oppressing them and taking advantage of them and not caring about them like they should. And the other thing they were doing, which was the ultimate sin, was they weren't following after God. Instead, they were following their own gods, the gods of the Canaanites and the gods of the people around them and just whoever God they could get their hands on, really, but not the one true God. Because we've talked about this before. You can't serve the one true God and other gods. God wants no other gods before him. And that doesn't mean that he's at the front of the line. It means when he looks out, there are none there. There are none before him. And so it wasn't enough that they just went to the temple and sacrificed sacrifices still. They needed to tear down the idols and get rid of them. And yet Israel was unwilling to do so. And it might seem like some of these things are issues that the Old Testament struggled with, but we don't struggle with as much today, but that's just not true. If you look at our world in the New Testament and even our world today, we tend to have these same problems and so we see in James chapter 127, or chapter 1, verse 27, you know, turn there, I'm just going to summarize it, that James actually says, a pure religion is one that takes care of those that are marginalized. A pure religion is one that takes care of those that are suffering. Now, James very specifically mentions widows and orphans, but I think he mentions widows and orphans because those were the ones that were not being taken care of at that time. I don't think he means just widows and orphans. I think he means all those that are suffering, all those that are seen as less in the eyes of your culture. All those that are seen as less by people around you, you take care of them. In fact, if you read on, that's the very last verse of chapter one. It starts off chapter two by talking about don't show favoritism to the rich when the poor is right there. So I think that the, you can make the context of that he's not just talking about widows and orphans here. You wanna know a pure religion 
a religion that follows after God and God alone. It's one that takes care of the less fortunate. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 23 says that uh, even from the very beginning, people struggled with idolatry. And the way they did this is they took uh, images and created them for themselves of what they wanted a God to be. And because of that, Paul actually says he gave them over to their sinful desires. And that happens even today. We look around us, and yes, they may not be a bird or a, a, a animal of some kind, and it may not be a man that we worship, so to speak, although I do think we tend to have a little bit of idol worship on people in our culture. They're called celebrities. And yet we tend to still worship things, though, don't we? Sometimes they take place as companies or sports teams or, or sometimes it's a job or something else, but we tend to put these things up on a pedestal where they just don't belong. And so instead of a statue, we have a handheld idol, one that we keep with us in our pocket. Instead of a statue, we miss church because our favorite sports team is playing. Instead of a statue, we make sure that we work and work and work even more than we need to work because our whole identity is focused on our job instead of making sure that we spend time in prayer and devotion to God. Not saying that any of these things are bad. I have a cell phone in my pocket right now. But what is the purpose of it? Am I putting it up on a pedestal or am I allowing God to use that for his glory? And that's what makes it an idol is when we are no longer allowing God to use it, but we're actually putting it up on a pedestal where it's above God. And then all of a sudden it becomes an idol. And so we still really struggle with the same things Jeremiah was talking about. And yet we tend to think of that that was in the past and those type of things aren't going to happen now, but we have a covenant with God. Yes, it's not set up exactly like the way that the Old Testament's set up. It's set up differently. It's a covenant of love and grace rather than law. But there's still expectations. There's still parameters that he has set forth. And those parameters are that he will save us if we follow and believe him. And part of following him is doing what he asks us to do, not because we're required by some law, but because we love him. And if we truly love him, that means we want to do what they want us to do. And so we want to do what God wants us to do because he knows what's best for us because we know he loves us more than anything on this earth. And so we will follow after him doing what he says, not because we're afraid of breaking some law, but because we're afraid of not doing what he wants because of our love for him. And so God punishes those for breaking the covenant He punishes those in the Old Testament by sending Babylon to him. And so because this covenant between God and Israel was broken by Israel's sin, there are consequences. When Judah sinned, continued sin against God, there was consequences. We know those consequences for them was that they sent Babylon to conquer them and put them in exile. And there was also a separation from God. Because you've got to remember at this time, God did not live within the heart's of Israel. He only was present there in the temple. That's where he made his presence be known. And so their only real connection to God, in a way, was going to the temple. And whenever they were taken and taken in exile, the temple was destroyed, and all of a sudden they were separated from God. It wasn't until the New Testament where God says, I will send the Holy Spirit to live within your heart, and you the church will be the temple. We don't need a physical representation of the temple anymore because we are the temple. And so we see that Judah had to face this exile and separation from God, and that was the consequence of their sin. For us today, there are really two categories of consequences that we face. The first is earthly, or you might say temporal, consequences that we have to face. And that is that sometimes whenever sin enters into our lives, we face very direct consequences of relationships destroyed. You have an affair in your marriage, and that relationship is never going to be the same. 
It doesn't matter if you even work things out and you forgive each other. That relationship has been damaged. Can it work through? Yes, by the grace of God and the love for each other, you can move past that, but it won't ever be the same. In fact, many times whenever that happens, the relationship is completely destroyed. You want to end a friendship, lie and gossip behind their back, and that will destroy a friendship very quickly. It will ruin it. You'll never have that friendship again like you once thought you would. And it's because of the sin that creeps into our lives, destroys these relationships. You want to see what happens whenever you are uh, uh, active, to say in nice terms, before you're married? You have things often like STDs or STIs or whatever they're being called nowadays. You have things that affect your life for the rest of your life because you sinned. And that's the way it goes. I'm not saying that God caused those individual things, but there are natural consequences for the sin that we commit. Sometimes it's just bitterness. Sometimes you get tired of people lying behind your back or doing different things. And so you tend to be bitter. And what happens is you get bitter, not just towards one person or one thing, but you get bitter all throughout your life. And before long, you can't really see people how God sees people because you're just so embittered by what's happening in the world. And that's a result of sin. And while these things do hurt, they are all temporary. They come and go, and we can overcome them. However, there's another consequence for sin, and that is the spiritual consequence and this is really very similar to what the, uh, the people of Judah had to face. And that is that there is a separation between us and God. Sometimes that separation is just here on this earth until we make amends and that we rededicate our lives to God or we turn over our lives to God by being baptized and committing our lives to him. Sometimes that separation is just for that long. Sometimes that separation, if you never committed your life to Jesus, is for all eternity and we have eternal death in hell. But there are consequences. There are consequences to sin. However, there is some good news. And that good news is that God is a God of mercy and God is a God of grace. And he will continue to show mercy and grace for as long as we are on this earth. He will continue to show mercy and grace. In fact, in the Old Testament, we tend to think of God as only a God of wrath in the Old Testament. But let's be honest, God is a God of mercy and grace and has been from day one. He could have struck down Adam and Eve whenever they sinned, but he didn't. He could have wiped humanity off the face of the earth completely and not saved Noah, but he didn't. He could have wiped Israel off the mat whenever they were complaining at the edge of the Red Sea but he didn't. He didn't do it at the golden calf. He didn't do it when David committed adultery with Bathsheba. He didn't do it when the kingdoms divided. And he didn't do it when Assyria or Babylon conquered the nation of Israel either. He continued to show grace. And he did this through the nation of Judah by allowing them one day to go home. He allowed him one day to go home, and still through the nation of Judah, there would come a Messiah that would come on this earth, and he would be able to save all of mankind. And it is that, that in the New Testament, we see God's ultimate act of grace that is upon us today. And that's that he has sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins. Yes, there are consequences to our sin, but here's the good thing. We don't have to pay all of those consequences. Someone does, but it doesn't have to be us. God sent Jesus to take on the consequences of our sin. And because of that, we can spend not eternal death, but eternal life with God. Because God is a God of grace. And so even though we may not be doing things perfectly, and even though we could probably get better at taking care of the marginalized and those that are in need, And even though we could probably get better at making sure we have no idols before us, God is continuing to give us second and third and a thousandth chances. And there will always be Jesus there, ready to take the consequences of our sin. Let us pray. Dear Father, we are grateful. 
grateful that you are a God of grace. That even though we don't deserve it, you have readily given it to us. And we can't thank you enough for that. Lord, I pray that we always remember the sacrifice you made and that we live our lives accordingly, Lord. And I pray that we leave today and that we try our hardest to serve and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple announcements before you leave today. Uh, we still have a few more of those baby bottles in the back. If you haven't grabbed one yet, those support Lighthouse Pregnancy Center. And um, I've said this, but I'll continue to say it. Uh, they uh, didn't have their banquet this year, which provides 70% of their funding. And so they are de in desperate need of people to do things like the baby bottle campaign and support them in some way. Please go sit down. And uh, so we want to make sure that we're supporting the best we can. And we got 20 bottles and 15 of them were taken. There's still five back there. I think I've gotten back like six or seven of those. You can bring those up to church and we'll get them to the pregnancy center for you. Or you can drop them off yourself, whatever you want to do. Uh, but I encourage you to do those. Put a check in there, put change in there. Whatever you can give is needed and welcomed. Um, also, I mentioned that uh, two weeks from today, Kelsey and I won't be here because we'll be on vacation. Uh, Jim Quick's going to come in and preach. And the reason why I had, we're having him come in is because uh, we know camp's been a little uh, off this year. And so there's been no summer camp like normal. And so I know for many of you, uh, you send your kids there, or if you're a preteen or teen or a grade schooler, you, you like to go there. Well, they are going to be doing some stuff in the fall, and so I thought having Jim come and kind of be able to explain what they're doing and be able to answer any questions after he preaches uh, would be helpful. And so if you um, have children that age or normally help out with camp and would like to help out with something like that, um, please come on that Sunday, support Jim, and listen to what he has to say. I'm sure it will be good. It's always been good when I've heard him preach. And so I hope that you'll come to that. And if you have questions about what the camp is doing going forward, um, please come and ask those of him after church uh, that week. And so that's, I believe it's Ju July 12th is that date. And so uh, that'll be in two Sundays. So I hope you'll come back and be a part of that. Thank you for coming today. And you are dismissed after the close. Yes. Uh, my brother's in the Fort Gibbons Quartet, as all of you know. Mm. And they're going to be performing a chartered patio tonight at 7. Okay. So tonight at 7, um, Sherry's brother, is, who's in a quartet, and they've performed around here many times, but uh, they'll be at the patio over there in Vandalia downtown, and so at 7 o'clock, and so if you'd like to hear them, you can go over there tonight. And bring your lawn chairs, she says, so there might not be a lot of seating available, so uh, yeah. Yeah, there's been a there's been a spike in teenage pregnancy that the pregnancy center wasn't necessarily expecting, and so um, you know when teenagers aren't in school and kept busy, sometimes they get themselves in trouble, and uh, so we want to pray for them, and also be praying for the pregnancy center as they try to minister to them. So, all right, well, thank you for coming today, and you are dismissed. Thank you. Mm -hmm.